Uh, good afternoon all. Uh, I'm giving you a quick overview about the work I'm developing right now. So the project I'm developing consists of an AI-based cancer characterization using Smith's supervised learning algorithms. This characterization could be performed with several different types of uh, cancer, but the focus of this project is lung cancer. Starting with motivation for the work itself. Uh, as some of you may know, although lung cancer is not the most common cancer in terms of new cases, it is way by far the leading cause of cancer-related deaths. And when a patient is diagnosed with this kind of cancer, depending on the stage, uh, he has several uh, treatments available, being target therapies, the most uh, promising ones with better clinical outcomes, because they are based on a new type of drugs that, um, as the name states, target specific genes and mutations that cause cancer. In lung cancer, there are several mutations that are already linked to lung cancer, and the most common one at and that already have uh, approved target therapies is EGFR. And for a, a patient to be a candidate for this type of, um, of treatments, it must be performed a full uh, characterization that usually it's done with a biopsy. Uh, although, <coughs> although this characterization uh, is done with biopsy, and although uh, besides it's, it is a really invasive um, procedure, also, uh, sometimes more than one or several uh, biopsies are needed for a full characterization. With this in mind, computer-aided diagnosis uh, can have the potential, can be the key to uh, perform this characterization using CT scans that are already collected during the clinical routine for assess the, the cancer itself. Relating to medical imaging, Deep learning is the state of the art, but uh, the problem is that it usually requires uh, huge amounts of data that are difficult to collect in the medical field. Uh, anyway, and uh, when I'm saying a huge amount of label of data is label data uh, data with the labels that are required for the characterization. But on the other hand, raw image, this is the CT scans itself without the information about the labels are usually easier to acquire. And for this reason, the use of Smith's supervised learning algorithms that could incorporate both label and unlabeled data can be the key to overcome this problem of scarcity of data. So briefly, the object of my thesis was to develop a method that would use both label and unlabeled data to perform this uh, characterization to assess a gene mutation status using CT scan images and the, then compare it with the full supervised one, a method developed only with label data. About the data that I had at hand, so I had two data sets, a small one with labels, and as usually happens when we are dealing with pathologies, uh, it's imbalanced, and then a bigger one, the one on the right, um, that is bigger, it could be bigger, but uh, with some inclusion criteria, it's uh, still around 700 patients, and it will be, it is, it will be known. It is the unlabeled data set. About the methodology itself that I'm using. So this is not yet fully known, even by the clinicians, uh, which tissues, or even if any, tissues and structures may be affected and can display uh, the mutations induced by these, uh, transformations induced by these mutations. I chose to use an holistic analysis. This is using the entire region of the lung instead of being focused only on the tumor region. To tackle this misprovised learning approach, there are different methods that could be used, but to explore the power of the adversarial training, I chose to use a GAN architecture, a generative adversarial network, and uh, you can see in the image a traditional GAN architecture that had to be adapted for this uh, classification problem. And this can, be do into different, this can be done in two different ways. The first one, by changing only the output layer for instead of having a binary classification being true or false, an image being true or false, have a, like an N plus one classification with the N classification uh, labels that we have, in my case only two, and an additional label that displays the probability of an image being false. 
The second option, uh, and is the one I'm working with, um, it represents like, we can say that it's a discriminator and a classifier that share a common backbone, a common future extraction layers, and then they have two different output layers, one for each of, in my case, binary classification tests. Uh, as GANs are really difficult to train, most of you must be aware of that, as they are really difficult to train, both in terms of stability and convergence. Instead of using this traditional architecture that starts with some random noise, some random vectors, I choose to stack an encoder on the top of the generator that receives real images, transform it into latent vectors, and these latent vectors are then fed to generators, so avoiding this random initialization. And now, at present, the work I'm developing consists of, uh, already I've chosen this architecture, so I'm dealing with different variations of this architecture, trying to achieve the best, uh, the best classification for the task at hand. Thank you. So just uh, uh, in, in this part, there will be no questions, but this next we're going for the coffee break. So if you have questions for the students, they will be happy to answer them, okay? Okay, so now we're going to change a little bit the topic. Uh, we're going to pass through cancer to beer. So my thesis is about reconciling prediction in the regression setting an application of Portuguese brewery industry, uh, full disclosure, to Superbog. Uh, but underneath this title, uh, there is a more concrete question is, how can we create insights for the marketing and uh, commercial team to improve our sales, to convince you to, to buy more products from, from, our, from ours, our company? So giving you a little bit of context, uh, Fast-moving consumer goods, it's a very extreme market, uh, very volatile in constant sh shaping. So it's very difficult to operate in this kind of market. So in producing insights is key to keep on top of our, our, of our performances. And this is kind of a roadmap that we use in Superbulk if you, you, if you want to send some innovation to the market. So it's a very complicated thing to, to navigate through. And, and in these kind of businesses, we have mainly two channels, if you might be aware. We have off-trade channels, big retailers, and we have on-trade channels where you do on-premises consumption, for example, restaurants, bars, hotels, and so on. So having a tool that correctly and accurately predict monthly shares, for example, shares being a KPI that we use in, in Superbook, could be a game changer. So we can pass from a corrective behavior to a proactive one. And for this, you can use forecast, or at least explainable forecast. That could be the, the, the biggest game changer to produce insights and retrieve all these insights. Obviously, the thing that, here we, that in here we are trying to do is not to produce the, the model itself, it's what are the insights that we can retrieve from the model. So at the end of the day, the sea level is not going to be interesting in, in how accurate you are going to do the forecasts, but how well we can explain them. Um, but to get there, we need to pass through all these, these components. So you can see that almost in every FMCG, you have an error key. So from, top to bar, from bottom to top, you can see that we have different packaging materials that aggregate into a sub-brand that you can sum to a brand, and then you can sum to the company, and then you can sum all of the competitors in the market to the total market view. So this is going to be a problem if you want to produce accurately forecast accurately for each level. For example, the base idea in, the, in here is it's obviously that once you do the, the, the review of the month's, month's monthly sales, you're going to start to add up and everything going to be okay, right? But once you start, try to do the, the add up of forecast, that's not going to be the, the case. So you need also Actually, besides the model, you need also to find a way to reconcile all the forecast to the, from the bottom to top or vice versa. So th this is one of the main objects of the work is which model could work better in this case, in, this, in these scenarios, and how can we reconcile everything 
to produce the most accurate forecast and which insights can we retrieve from it. A quick methodology, it's quite straightforward, so data collection, pre-processing, EDA, and the rule 60 to 80 percent of my time was spent in here, not, not big surprises. After that, feature engineer played a major role in my, in my work, so this is the key to produce insights, fruitful insights for the commercial and marketing team. After that, we compared a bunch of models that we can just handpick from, for example, M5 competition, uh, use a benchmark, for example, Arima, compare, select them for the different hierarchical levels, and then choose the best reconciling uh, operation that you have at the end. At the end, we have some results. Uh, this is a very particular case of, of results. I'm sorry for the lack of uh, information. Uh, it's on purpose, obviously. So this is a particular type of brand beer that we are observing in here, and as you can see, uh, the pandemic had a huge effect, which is uh, we have a, a more or less mature market and all of a sudden the trend starts to increase. So the, the shape of seasonality starts to, to flatten and this, this is a major problem to produce accurate forecasts. So this, is, this was key to produce the, pro, the appropriate features to, to then feed the model. After that, we can see uh, how well the model starts to, to forecast uh, considering the, the, the baseline, okay? So this is with a few of standard features, like a few legs, a few differences, a few uh, statistic uh, features that were, were created after that, based on the, the, the data analysis and also some external variables, some KPIs that we use inside the company. And then, we start to think this, th that was a general model, uh, and then we need to, to go deep into the hierarchy. So this is a snapshot of all of, uh, not all, but 80% of time series that I was working with. So they are very, very different. Depends on the strategy that you have. For example, in and out products are very used to create dynam dyna dynamism inside the company, but they have only sales in a specific time frame of the year. Um, so try to forecast everything and reconcile everything together. It's uh, it's a mess. Uh, and on this plot uh, on the on your right, you can see how well the reconciliation step worked. So the blue dots are the original forecasts, and then we have the red dots that are the reconciled ones that ap approaches the results to the line which are the the real values. So there are a lot, still a lot of work to be done. This is only for a specific brand. We have waters, we have ciders, and we have all the compet competitors in the market to do the same thing, to retrieve insightful uh, information, to then fine tune how, the, our, how our commercial and marketing team is going to be worked. And that's it, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So my topic is not as cool as the previous ones. Uh, I'm, talking, I'm going to talk to you about prediction of uh, shell finite element stresses using uh, convolutional neural networks. I guess you're, most of you are wondering what finite elements are. I know that Miguel isn't. <laughs> um, so. So the finite element method is a popular numerical method for solving differential equations. It's typically used in many areas of engineering, such as structural analysis, heat transfer, fluid flow, etc. Uh, finite element models are usually uh, computationally demanding, and its main assumption, and most importantly for this presentation, is the assumption that um, this method splits a large system into a mesh of uh, simpler parts called the finite elements. So, uh, picking up from here, uh, we know that uh, in this case a structure uh, using the finite element method is uh, discretized in the smaller parts. 
We also know that the pictures as we know them are images are uh, also a discretization of the real world. So um, we also know that CNNs are widely known to work well with images. So the main idea of this thesis is to uh, use CNNs given this resemblance to work with finite elements as well. So how am I doing that? Um, we know that um, regular picture is composed by a, a set of channels, in this case, red, green, and blue. So the idea is to replicate this analogy uh, using, uh, for the prediction of a map like that one using um, features of the model. Oops, sorry. So I developed a data set of uh, 18 thousand models like that one on the picture. Uh, this is the correspondence to the model for the, the, the feature maps itself. For instance, the geometry is the contour of the finite elements. The loads are the, um, the, pink, the pink arrows and the supports that tiny uh, triangles and then the results it's direct. So this is a, a picture of the model of my top performer model. Uh, it's an, an encoder-decoder type of model with a bunch of convolutional uh, layers, uh, some residual squeeze and excitation blocks and some tricks there at the end. I'm not going to elaborate much on that. Um, here's a, an, a good example of one result. Of course, I would have to pick a good one for this presentation. Um, those two last plots show the error, but at different scales. So uh, the, the, the one on the left it shares the same scale as the ground truth. It's a clean sheet in that case. And the, the, the one on the right is like a close up. So we can see that there are actual errors. In this case, uh, it's still a good result, but not as good. We can see some already some artifacts in the, in the, the error plot. And finally, this slide kind of sums up the progress that I've been making. Right now, I'm still finishing the training of the models, followed by the analysis of the results and then the conclusions. And that's it from my side. Uh, so my name is Rafael, and I'm doing um, the thesis on data, machine division, and reinforcement learning for explainable and safe autonomous driving of platinum vehicles. Um, so to give you a bit of context why I chose this uh, theme is basically, basically because um, the self-driving cars has been um, really growing in the last few years, and a hot topic is about the platinum vehicles. So uh, because this can have a lot of benefits for the logistics and for the supply chain. So imagine having trucks being, drive, uh, being driven uh, based on platooning. With this, we can basically increase efficiency. So we have one driver um, driving more than one truck. So we can deliver more in the same time, as well as uh, take the, the advantage of the tunnel air to reduce the carbon feed, food, footprint and reduce the fuel uh, consumption, and finally increase the safety on the road by having less humans driving. <laughs> Typically, the approach for a self-driving car is to use a lot of sensors, uh, mainly lidars, radars, cameras, GPS, and then this information uh, is going to be processed by, by a, an algorithm that is going to take a decision. But what, the question is, what if when we only have vision information available? So the objective of this thesis is to use a monocular camera to uh, perceive the environment. Basically, uh, we are going to use techniques such as segment, image segmentation to uh, split the image into the different objects present on it. And we are going to use also uh, transfer learning to predict the distance to the leader. And then, we are going to have a reinforcement learning algorithm to take a decision. Basically, those are two kinds of decisions. One for the steering part, 
another, another one for the throttle or the brake part. So as I'm saying, we are going to have, in this case, two agents, one for each, one for each action. The innovation factor here is to only have the monocular camera, uh, to perceive the environment and follow the leader and using explainable AI. So we are going to be able to explain why our uh, reinforcement algorithm is uh, taking certain decision. All of this is, is done in a simulator called Carla. So starting with the, um, the steering part, so basically, uh, and this is an image for, from the, the simulator, our, uh, we are seeing the leader and our car is going to retrieve the, this image. This image is going to pass into an autoencoder, then is, is going to segment the image into different objects, and we are going only to focus on the car, on our leader. So doing some um, matrix uh, manipulation, we can extract two features, two binary features, uh, the left and the right. So basically when left is one and right is zero, it means that the leader is on the left of our agent. When left is zero, right is one, then the, um, the leader is on the right of our agent. And finally, uh, when both are zero, it means that we are aligned with the, with the leader. Uh, in the way that we define the state, it's impossible to have one one for obvious reasons. Uh, when we have this state, so we are going to pass this into our reinforcement learning algorithm. It's a proximal policy optimization. It's based on neural network with one input layer, several hidden layers, and finally one output layer, uh, which has three nodes and a softmax activation function that is going to produce uh, the probability of taking one of the possible actions, going straight, turn left, or turn right, and our agent will pick the one with the highest probability. Moving to the explainability uh, for the steering, so we can see that uh, we are using shape values for this. Um, the turn left and turn right actions are symmetric, so basically when left is one, uh, we are, our agent um, will turn left. When the right is one, our agent will turn right. And when one of them is one, the probability of going straight uh, is lower. So basically when both are zero, the probability of going straight is higher. Moving to the throttle part or th throttle slash um, brake. So the, um, the process is the same, uh, but then we are only focused on the leader and we are using this image to predict the distance to the leader. So we take um, the advantage of transfer learning to help speed up the training process. Uh, and in this case, we are using exception. Basically, we are removing the last layer, which is an no uh, output layer with 1,000 nodes uh, with a softmax activation function for because of the ImageNet uh, data set. And here we are using only one node with a linear activation function to predict the distance. Uh, once we have the distance, we, are, we also have the previous distance, distance and our velocity, and this is going to be the state for the second agent. In this case, the algorithm is the same, is the same but in this case, the output layer is not going to be a three nodes with a um, softmax activation function, but one node with a 10 activation function. That it's going to produce a value between minus one and one, and when the value is above zero, it means that we are going to accelerate in the, on the intensity of the value predicted. And when the value is below zero, we are going to break on the same intensity. Uh, the explainability for this part. So basically, when the distance are higher, the probability of accelerating is also higher because we want to keep the, a certain distance to the leader. And when the uh, our velocity is higher, the probability of uh, braking is also higher because we want to keep the, a safe distance for the leader. And now it's a short time, so I, I, I basically have a video to show you uh, our agent playing around in the simulator and following the leader. <laughs> So basically, we are 
por prática concertada, restritiva da concorrência, o regulador decidiu agora aplicar uma reforma total de mais de 190 milhões de euros. A Associação Portuguesa de Hospitalização Privada foi a primeira a reagir a para recorrer a decisão. O grupo de é muito grande que não cumpriu qualquer infração ao direito da concorrência e não deixará por isso de exercer o direito de defesa. A crise do grupo Melo também representa a decisão da autoridade da concorrência que diz estranhar e aumentar, anunciando que vai avançar com o recurso para deputar o esclarecimento da verdade e reposição da justiça. Ficou com o contacto com os idiotas da SIG, a Alcarita. Aos 128 dias de vida, isto é do último grande centro urbano do Dom Vaz, no oeste do Brasil. No Twitter, as imagens confirmam o feedback que havia com o senhor Luís Chaus, que rodaram já a alegada retirada das tropas ucranianas, o último centro urbano da região do Lugar. Cidade do oeste da Ucrânia é atacada atualmente em quatro frentes. As forças russas, então, os conflitos de relação já conquistou a refinaria de outras populações estratégicas nos Azotórios. Bonjour, Mr. Lorenzi, Mr. Lorenzi, Mr. Lorenzi, Mr. Lorenzi, Mr. Lorenzi, Mr. Lorenzi, Mr. Tomaram em si a estratégia e o posicionamento à rotas no âmbito das negociações com a área CIE e o sistema de saúde. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, so we have been, been doing this project in a um, Cosmect online store. So our idea was to predict the custom purchasing behavior and of course to try to increase the sales. Okay. So it was our methodology. Uh, we have been using all of those softwares and technologies to try to, um, to identify the, the custom behavior. So we got a two years data set and we got those numbers. Uh, it was more than one million order lines, um, more than 300,000 unique customers. And <clears throat> we identified that only 14% of those customers used to buy again and this company. So the idea was to understand what happens and to try to make these numbers better. So we have divided our project in three parts. The first one to understand the dot set. Secondly, to try to identify clusters and then to, to have a classification uh, in clustering. Uh, when you saw the data set for the first time, it got, we got like 23 features and it was not enough to, to have the information we wanted. Then we actually we produce more than 50 new features and with those dat data, data and we have found a four, four, four clusters to show to the client with some recommendations. So we identify uh, our best customers. It was that purple line. And the blue one was our target. And the red one and the green one, they were sporadic. So our idea uh, was to make this blue one to became a best customer. In the end, we showed to, the, to our client um, how to try to do that. And it, it looks quite simple, but you, you should remember that we have 300,000 clients in this data set. So um, 
we have tried about six different techniques to, to get those numbers. Finally, we test nine different algorithms to try to do the classification. And after everything, we got uh, two great results to naive banes and to other boost algorithms. It here, it's 22% in 19% predictability. So what it means, if the, the, the client do nothing, he will find 14% of recurrence. So if he spend money doing some market advertising or whatever, he will be having 14% of the clients buying back. But uh, with those recommendations, it could be like 22% or 19% depends on the technique they use. We have decided to find, um, to look for new features, and we have found this using the neural network, it would become the 23 in about 70% of assertivity. So that was quite a good number, and of course, 23 is better than 14. The, the main problem we got, it was the data set was really unbalanced. So it was a very difficult, it was very difficult to work with those numbers. So our recommendation also is for them to look, to have better information in order to provide, uh, to, to, to get better, better, uh, uh, better classification, Accuracy, thank you. So the graph shows that the test and training model was quite good, uh, even with this unbalanced and that set. Um, we also did some, we create some association rules, rules so to tell to the client, to the customer, if he brought a shampoo, so why not to brought uh, a soap? So th this was, these were our results. And when the, the client go to the website, when he choose some product, it show another product that makes sense to them to have. And here were our recommendations to the business and to look to the clustering. So they could be working with the best customers for them and to try to make those target clients in a good target, in the best customers also. Uh, not to spend so much money with these sporadic customers and to use our recommendation system in order to suggest new products to, to the client also to make it to buy a little bit more. So that's it. Thank you. We are waiting. So I'm going to take uh, the extra minute just to introduce the team. So we are five. My name is João Pedro Pedro. Pedro is here with me, and I'm going to talk about a um, uh, uh, predictive model for classification of um, engagement of, cli of um, candidates or applicants to a, uh, a job in a job matchmaking site. Um, okay.
So, sorry for the delay, technical issues. So, um, so we, like I said, we want to predict uh, if a candidate engages with a, a company that has published in the website. So the process uh, is uh, the candidate uh, applies obviously in the website. Then there is an initial review by the site's management and they can reject immediately the, 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 the application if necessary, but then it goes through an, a company review uh, who, who is the client of the website, and finally there is a decision either to engage or to reject, so this will be our successful or unsuccessful states of our um, classifier. So we put ourselves as business goals to predict at the moment of application if an applicant will engage with the company and moreover to give uh, for the company's uh, profit the, the idea if the, the candidate is going to be successful or not in the application uh, later on. <clears throat> so we followed the CRISP methodology. We started with business understanding, uh, data understanding, data preparation from these uh, we result, we result uh, from the feature engineering part, we had 29 um, features, ma mainly on the skills, if the, the applicant has the skills appropriate for the job. Um, also on location, is the job the, and the candidate on the, the same location, the experience level, how many competitors, and also time features, for example, on how often the company reviews applications. This was a, a relevant feature for the process. Um, next, we entered in the modeling phase. We had uh, 10 uh, algorithms that we uh, considered here. Uh, we had uh, six data sets, I'm going to explain in a few seconds. Then we obviously had to do hyperparameter tuning with machine learning tools and grid search. And we uh, evaluated those models on, on four uh, metrics, the F1 score, the rock area under the curve, recall, and also this Breer score loss that uh, gives the quality of the applicant's uh, application. So in terms of modeling, um, we started with an imbalanced data set, uh, a curated data set of 15 to 85% imbalance. Then we had two splits for the data set. So we had a random split, a stratified random split, uh, where we left uh, scikit learn uh, do the, the split. And then we also used uh, um, a sorted split where we guaranteed that the, the same candidates for a given job are either told all of them in the training set or in the testing set. And then we combine these two splits with uh, three techniques for modeling. One where we use the imbalanced data set, one where we use overlap, uh, oversample, another one where we use the undersample. So we have six data sets to test. And then we apply the 10 uh, algorithms and the stratified five-fold cross-validation to get the best models for each one of these algorithms. And we did um, an evaluation or an optimization on these three uh, metrics. And from them, you, you have uh, uh, 180 models, if I remember correctly. Um, and then finally, we, we picked up the best one to do feature selection where we use backward and forward a floating selection. So these are uh, the results for um, the six data sets on when we optimize them for the FU1 score. We have same pictures for rock area and the curve and recall. And uh, I'm presenting here the results on rock area and of the curve. And you see um, that they are rock area and of the curve is more or less uniform, although obviously some better than the other one. So the, ra the uh, random forest bootstrap class weighting, um, it's one of the best. XG boost is also very good. Um, this is a rock area under the curve. Um, when you look at the recall, recall is relevant because that's where you identify the positive cases in an imbalanced data set is very important. So um, the rain, random forest behave better than all the other ones, um, except perhaps naive bays. And we see that in the imbalanced data sets, random forest actually rains all over the other ones. So. The next step was to look at uh, sequential uh, feature selections. So we start here. I'm showing only the backward uh, selection. We start with 27, and we realize that when you have 13, that you have uh, actually better uh, results for the F1 score, and, and this also for the other metrics. And finally, um, we tested the, sensi uh, the sensitivity of uh, each algorithm to the optimization metric. And for oh, here, you don't see very well. So here, you, you 
So each one here represents F1 score, recall, or rock area in the curve. You realize that the rock area under the curve is rather insensitive, that F1 score is a bit more but less. The oversampling uh, data sets are the ones that are more sensitive. And that the recall definitely has a sensitivity, particularly in the oversampling uh, oversample data sets, although for the unbalanced data set, which is the more um, daily occurrence, it works uh, actually quite good. So as conclusions, so we, we were successful in creating machine learning models for successful identify uh, candidates uh, with engagement. Uh, random forest bootstrap, class weighting, XG boost seems to be the more robust algorithms. Uh, overfitting, um, we believe there is some overfitting of the train data sets. The results I'm showing you here is just from the test data sets. In the, in the train data sets, we have better results. Though the results are modest, obviously, which is not so surprising for imba such imbalanced data sets. And, and also we got uh, um, some recognitions for the company that we, we can help them sort candidates by interest for the companies. And we hoped with this to help them uh, optimize their time at the company. Thank you very much for your attention. And